Hey Jexiteers, thanks again for stopping by. If you're new to the channel, my name is Riley and I'm a former Jehovah's Witness. When I was about 9 or 10 years old, I went to the Kingdom Hall one evening for the midweek meeting. That meeting was a very special meeting because it was the written review. As its name suggests, the written review was a written examination that all congregation members would take every few weeks. The test consisted of a mixture of multiple choice and true or false questions and some questions would require a brief written answer. The questions were based on the material covered during the midweek meetings since the date of the last written review and the congregation was given about 30 to 45 minutes to complete the test. When the time had expired, an elder would take to the platform, go through each question one by one and call out the correct answer so that each member of the congregation could mark their paper and give themselves a final score. These written reviews were compulsory for all congregation publishers, a publisher being someone who's qualified to engage in preaching. Children, on the other hand, were given a non-mandatory test of about 12 simple questions to test basic Bible knowledge. On this particular evening, I completed my child's version of the written review and achieved a 100% score. Understandably, I was quite pleased with myself and I couldn't wait for the meeting to end so that I could tell someone how well I'd performed. At the close of the meeting, I went to the cloakroom to retrieve my coat and as I was zipping it up, an elder walked in. Here was my opportunity to tell someone how well I'd performed in the written review. For the rest of my life, I will never forget the conversation that followed. Enthusiastically, I shouted out, Uncle Shadrach, Uncle Shadrach, I got 100% on the written review. To which he replied, that shows that you have a head full of knowledge, but do you have a heart full of love and appreciation for Jehovah's spiritual food? Now, I'm sure that Uncle Shadrach's response was well meant and came from a good place, and I bear no animosity towards him at all. In fact, I have very fond memories of other conversations that I had with him during my childhood. But needless to say, his response left the nine-year-old me feeling completely deflated. Fully expecting praise and a verbal pat on the back, what I actually got was admonition and a very clear message that my best wasn't good enough. Little did I know that this one conversation would characterize the rest of my life as a Jehovah's Witness. For the next three decades, I would serve Jehovah God with the deep-seated belief that I lacked a fundamental requirement for his approval. About 20 years and four congregations later, I was at the Kingdom Hall for another midweek meeting. During that meeting, an elder gave a talk entitled, Don't Let Your Strength Become Your Weakness, or words to that effect. The talk was essentially a warning against self-reliance and leaning on one's own understanding, a reference to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. During the talk, he made the point that intelligence is a positive characteristic or even a strength but it can also become a weakness if it leads us to rely on our own understanding instead of deferring all important decisions, reasoning and thinking ability to Jehovah God. And it's that point that brings me to the reason for this video. The leadership of the Jehovah's Witness organization actively stigmatizes intelligence, celebrates ignorance and suppresses the thinking ability of its members. And I'm going to give you three examples of how they do this. Now, at this point, you may be thinking that my first example will be the prohibition against higher education. But that example is way too easy and quite frankly, beyond debate. In fact, my first example is how the organization reframes and redefines the term independent thinking. Independent thinking can be defined as having the confidence to draw on your own intelligence depend on your own judgment, having your own views and values to guide you rather than someone else's. However, Watchtower completely rejects this accepted definition of something positive and reframes it as something negative. The January 15th, 1983 edition of the Watchtower magazine contains an article entitled Armed for the Fight Against Wicked Spirits. Under the subheading Fight Against Independent Thinking, it has this to say. As we study the Bible, we learn that Jehovah has always guided his servants in an organized way. 
And just as in the first century there was only one true Christian organization, so today Jehovah is using only one organization. Yet, there are some who point out that the organization has had to make adjustments before, and so they argue, this shows that we have to make up our own mind on what to believe. This is independent thinking. Why is it so dangerous? There's so much to discuss here in that one paragraph that I barely know where to begin. But let's start with the title of the article itself, Armed for the Fight Against Wicked Spirits. They're associating the way a person thinks with a literal battle against wicked spirits. The implication being that if you think for yourself, you're likely to lose that battle. Whereas if you allow the organisation to do your thinking for you, then you'll win. Then there's a statement about the adjustments that the organisation has had to make. Here's the problem. If this organisation, as it does, claims to receive its direction and doctrine directly from Jehovah God himself, and yet it still needs to make adjustments periodically, then it's logical to come to at least one of the following conclusions. A. The doctrine doesn't actually come from God. B. The doctrine does actually come from God, but sometimes God changes his mind or makes mistakes. Or C. The doctrine does come from God, but the governing body doesn't always understand or follow it correctly. I think it's safe to say that most active Jehovah's Witnesses would outrightly reject the first two of those conclusions, which leaves us with option C. If that is indeed the case, then how can they legitimately claim to be God's sole channel of communication and act as the final authority in interpreting the Bible while expelling those who disagree with their dogma? None of this is rocket science. It doesn't take a genius to work any of this out. But what it does take is independent thinking. The very thing that the governing body says is dangerous. I wonder why. The second example can be seen in the February 1st, 1983 edition of the Watchtower magazine in an article entitled, Are You One God Would Choose? Paragraph 5 of that article says, are you the type of person that God would choose to do the work he wants done in the earth today? If so, it means that you must be prepared to be viewed as a fool by the world. It also says, So to be a successful servant of Jehovah God, you must be willing to proceed in a way that will make you seem foolish from the world's standpoint. Also, the September 15th, 1992 edition of the Watchtower magazine in an article entitled Jehovah's Use of Foolishness to Save Those Believing has this to say Soon, at Armageddon Jehovah God will cause all the wisdom of the wise men to perish He will shove aside all the intelligence of the intellectual men who made predictions of how their new world order would bring better conditions for mankind the war of the great day of God the Almighty will incinerate all the sophistry, philosophy and wisdom of this world. The only ones who will survive that war and gain life in God's new world are those who obey what this world calls foolishness. Yes, Jehovah's glorious kingdom good news. These articles are mental manipulation of the worst kind and tick so many boxes on the bite model that I don't even know where to start. If you've never heard of the BIAT model, it's a framework for determining whether or not an organisation is a cult or high control group that exerts undue influence on its members. It was developed by PhD cult expert and former cult member Stephen Hassan. The acronym BIAT stands for Behaviour Control, Information Control, Thought Control and Emotion Control. The four primary ways in which cults and high control groups harm their members. These articles I've referenced clearly show that the governing body manipulates Jehovah's Witnesses into celebrating their own ignorance of so-called worldly wisdom so that when they're derided for being foolish they feel pleased, validated and accepted by Jehovah. The articles also condemn those who are quote unquote worldly wise as being worthy of destruction at Armageddon. 
The clear message being presented here is this. If you're someone the world considers to be wise, then your chances of surviving the war of the great day of God the Almighty are slim to none. So wouldn't it be better to be someone the world considers to be stupid? It's no wonder that a 2008 study showed that Jehovah's Witnesses in the United States are by far the least educated religious group in the country. My third example will show how the life of a Jehovah's Witness is so incredibly busy that they operate on a sort of mental autopilot, lacking both the time and energy to critically examine their own beliefs. The January 15th, 1967 edition of the Watchtower magazine in an article entitled Why So Much To Do says this. No question about it. Today, the Christian witnesses of Jehovah have much to do. There is reading and studying of the Bible and Bible literature. There are five weekly meetings of the congregation to prepare for and attend. There are all the various features of the Christian field ministry, preaching from house to house, making return visits and conducting Bible studies in the homes of the people. There is also the need to assist their Christian brothers, as well as preparing for parts on the various programs and so forth. And those who are servants in the congregation have still more duties to discharge. If you've never been a Jehovah's Witness, it will no doubt be difficult to grasp just how exhausting the witness schedule is. Not to mention that many Jehovah's Witnesses do this while holding down a full-time job. Speaking from experience, it's not uncommon to look around the Kingdom Hall during a meeting and see several members of the congregation fast asleep from sheer exhaustion. Also on the subject of being busy, listen to what governing body helper Robert Saranko has to say. I would like to talk about a valuable asset that every one of us possesses, time. It certainly is something that is on our minds as we go about our day's activities. Just think of how often you look at a clock, your watch, or your cell phone to check the time. Why do we do that? Probably to see if we are ahead of time, on time, behind time, or out of time. Just think, we have exactly the same number of hours to use each day that Jesus Christ had when he was on the earth. And we can be sure that no human used his time more wisely than did God's Son. It has been said that time is the most valuable thing a human can spend. And so it is up to us how we will use the time that is at our disposal. In this regard, there is a Bible principle that gives us good direction. A principle that was shared with us by the Apostle Paul at Philippians 1, 9 and 10. He wrote in verse 9, and this is what I continue praying. And in verse 10, that you may make sure of the more important things. Therefore, the theme of this month's program is make time for the more important things. In addition to the obligation to work to support one's family, to care for necessary household chores, to look after one's children or aging parents, we have many important things of a spiritual nature that deserve our full attention. Reading and meditating on God's Word, studying the Bible personally and in family worship, preparing for and attending congregation meetings, caring for any responsibilities that we have in the congregation, and participating in the Christian ministry. Have you ever felt that you did not have enough time to do all those things? that you have difficulty fitting all the spiritual activities into your busy so, life? We have to be selective about how we spend the time that we have. A Christian who diligently cultivates his spirituality can be confident of Jehovah's blessing, whereas a person who is distracted by worthless activities puts his relationship with God in danger. How can we avoid that? By not taking valuable time away from spiritual pursuits to spend on the things that distract us from serving Jehovah whole soul. This overly demanding lifestyle is a common tactic used by cults and high control groups to dull the senses of their members. In fact, it appears on the bite model under point 2D of the information control section. Keep members busy so they don't have time to think and investigate. 
But please, don't take my word for it. The Watchtower magazine I referenced earlier has this to say under the subheading, A Protection for Us. Actually, having plenty to do in the work of the Lord is a protection, a blessing for us. In what way? In that since we are no part of the world, having much to do protects us from its temptations and snares that beset us on every hand. It is thoughtful on the part of the faithful and discreet slave to provide us with plenty to read and study, with many meetings to attend and with much to do in the field ministry. By keeping busy with these things, we will find our minds filled with the things that are upbuilding. This protects our minds against the spirits of this world and ourselves from being occupied with the works of the flesh. What we just read is essentially an admission that keeping oneself busy with religious activities is a means for controlling one's thoughts. Of course, the article puts a positive spin on this, but it's mental manipulation nonetheless. Since my Jexit from the organisation, I've heard many experiences from former witnesses who started waking up from their indoctrination after a change in their circumstances meant that they were no longer as busy with religious activities as they were previously. Here's an experience from just one of them, my friend and former elder, Bo Fair. I was an extremely busy young elder slash full-time pioneer. Also, I was married to a regular pioneer. Finally, one day, my conscience got the best of me as a believer, and I confess I had watched pornography on the internet. When that happened, I went through a judicial committee, and all of my quote-unquote privileges were removed. And all I could do for the first time as an adult was sit and listen at the meetings. No busy work, no more talks, no commenting, no distractions, only listening. As I listened, this led me to being un uncomfortable with what was being said, what was being said about Armageddon and other topics. It didn't at that point lead me to disbelief, but it did lead me to a discomfort with the beliefs that I held. That feeling combined with how the congregation members all of a sudden seemed to look at me as a failure, as a lesser person that I had been when I held the position as an elder, eventually led to some cracks in my faith. At that time, I was still conducting multiple Bible studies with people in the territory, and while given one of those Bible studies, I realized that I didn't actually believe the things I was saying. That it wasn't actually me saying those things, but rather I was parroting the thoughts of another person. And when that clicked for me, I realized I needed to look into what I actually believed. What were my doubts? This, of course, led me down a long path of research. And it was the first time, as Jehovah's Witness, that I had done thorough, objective research about my own beliefs and about the organization I was a part of. Of course, once you start down that path, it's very hard to remain within the organization. So eventually, that research, all of that study, looking into things, also searching myself, my own thoughts, my own beliefs, led me out of the organization and into a much better new life. So to answer this video's titular question, are Jehovah's Witnesses anti-intellectual? Yes and no. No, because honestly, the organization is against any characteristic that could lead a member to renounce their faith, not just intelligence specifically. But also, yes, because the organization stigmatizes and suppresses intelligence as potentially being one of those characteristics. In short, you can be a smart Jehovah's Witness, but the organization's leadership would much rather that you weren't. 
Thank you all for watching to the end of the video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel with notifications so that you don't miss any future content. Special thanks to my patrons for their ongoing support, especially in recent times. You guys are the best. If you would like to support what I do, please check the video description for the various ways in which you can do that. And an extra special thanks to my friend Bo Fair for helping me out with this video. Bo has a great podcast called Armageddon in Retrospect, where he discusses various aspects of witness theology, as well as his own experiences as being a witness. The podcast is insightful, informative, very funny, and well worth listening to. So please check it out. The link to it is in the video description below. Thanks again for watching. Please proceed to the Jexit in an orderly fashion, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching to the very end of the video. If you haven't already done so, please like, leave a comment and subscribe to the channel. If you like my work and want to help me continue doing it, please support me on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash jexit underscore 2020. And with that, I'd like to sincerely thank these very special patrons who make these videos possible.